Hello everyone. Welcome to our amazing panel called Agripreneurship in Action. And today we are going to learn or hear from some experts, agripreneurs who's doing some amazing things um, in the digital world that we now live in, that we are forced to live in. And we're going to hear about some of their experiences um, post COVID-19. We are going to hear about how they are using digital tools in their agripreneurship um, endeavors and their businesses and to really understand how digital tools are affecting and affecting on our food systems presently. Right, so I am Alpha Senon, founder and executive director of YFAM, and you will be hearing from me later on as well. Firstly, I would like to introduce Ms. Ashna Singh to share with us on her experiences. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ashna Singh. I'm the co-founder and COO of Moo Farm, a dairy technology startup working with smallholder dairy farmers in India with a mission to make farmers prosperous. Uh, before I jump on, uh, let me give you a brief background about the dairy industry in India. Uh, India is the largest milk producer. We uh, have 187 million tons of milk production every year, which is 20% of the global production. Uh, this is mainly because we have the highest number of cattle. 30% of the world's cattle population with 300 million cattle and around 100 million uh, smallholder, uh, medium-sized dairy farmers working in the industry every day. Unfortunately, dairy farming in India is highly inefficient. Uh, we are per cow output per day is four liters compared to around 30 liters in uh, Europe. Uh, the biggest reasons for this is because the smallholder farmers face lack of access to a lot of things required for efficient dairy farming, such as uh, veterinary services for treatment, disease and uh, breeding, uh, information and knowledge, nutritional inputs, as well as financial services. This entire gap has further been uh, kind of uh, exaggerated, stretched because of the recent pandemic. For example, if we take uh, a case of uh, state of Punjab, we can see the headlines that the milk prices uh, went down, input costs got up, uh, the rural economy took a big hit, and uh, farmers uh, kind of faced more challenges than usual. Uh, this is where Moo Farm comes in. We are br building a connected commerce for farmers. So from an online community where they can connect with peer farmers and subject matter experts to get the queries resolved, access to information, a lot of knowledge about best dairy practices, uh, connecting with qualified veterinarian using our Vet Connect, uh, a platform for cattle trading, uh, providing them access to nutritional inputs through an e-commerce platform in the future and uh, uh, fintech services, uh, cattle insurance and credit, and finally access to markets in the uh, coming months. Um, focusing on how we landed in the connected commerce model and our, our features of uh, e-veterinarian and community, uh, COVID actually the pandemic kind of accelerated the growth and our idea and uh, I will share how uh, Moo Farm kind of adapted our uh, technology and tools to the entire pandemic. So uh, for example, uh, the, the, the access problem kind of increased where of, uh, due to the entire uh, lockdown in India where the farmers could not get in touch with veterinarians, uh, uh, with, with physical visits happening, no physical visits happening in the villages. Uh, that is where Moo Farm started a toll-free number for farmers to uh, connect with qualified veterinarians in our project locations, three, uh, three states. We received more than 5,000 plus uh, uh, calls. Um, uh, digging deeper into the data analytics part, uh, cattle health turned out to be the biggest uh, reason for them to get in touch with veterinarians, followed by uh, farm management, nutrition, and milk production. Uh, this led to us more sharpening and a creation of a uh, feature within the application called eDairy Mitra, wherein uh, farmers will have a list of qualified veterinarians that they can touch touch base with. Uh, there's absolutely transparent and cheaper access and pricing uh, compared to a physical visit. So to give you an example, uh, with our toll-free pilot, we understood that uh, we got 
at least validation uh, that uh, 70 to 80 percent of the problems that the farmers are facing can be solved virtually rather than every each uh, you know uh, problem requiring a physical visit because it costs more um, so this gives us um, much more transparent and still the uh, queries are resolved uh, of course uh, linking it to each cattle's timeline and giving an e-prescription via our application um, the next thing we also felt in the pandemic was uh, uh, while the access was a huge problem, they felt like there was this huge need for connect uh, completely missing because uh, otherwise they would talk to their, uh, you know, uh, peer farmers or attend some uh, dairy fairs or exhibitions or, you know, uh, uh, government agents still coming to the villages and uh, veterinarians coming to the villages, but that completely was all on a standstill but we couldn't let this this gap affect in the information reaching the farmers because more than ever uh, you know they had to be aware about uh, still about those practices what are the schemes that the government is providing any subsidies guidance by experts etc and that is where the idea uh, of you know creating a community platform called move farm sabha came into being and we uh, it's been uh, 90 plus days three plus months that we've been running this successfully wherein all this information has been shared uh, talking specifically on the data it's turned out to be so insightful um, that uh, we um, just understanding what they need we realized that uh, cattle buy and sell turned out to be uh, one of the biggest things of why they were connecting on a community and this is how we further adapted that uh, you know in the next 45 days our cattle trading platform would be live uh, in our application itself because 70 more than 70 percent of the posts were about cattle trade trading so again uh, uh, you know adapting to the um, the entire pandemic and the global landscape and kind of reiterating and understanding your uh, customers better really helped us uh, during this entire uh, three to six months uh, period. Uh, further, some stats again kind of uh, uh, proving uh, what I was just telling about. So the MUFAM community is 11,000 plus in, in the particular state with a stickiness ratio of 70% daily. We've been, uh, th since we have uh, started the new uh, application with with the uh, connect to veterinarian feature we have around 400 daily installs which is uh, eight times what we were uh, having last month so it's been uh, uh, great in terms of uh, adapting and realizing what exactly your customers need with the entire changing environment so uh, yeah thank you Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. I am delighted to engage with other agripreneurs to share my story. My name is Ndidio Konko Muneli. I'm a social innovator based in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm a serial social entrepreneur. So I've started a number of companies in the food and agriculture landscape, Sahel Consulting, Ace Foods, and most recently, Nourishing Africa. And Nourishing Africa was born out of the realization that Africa is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. There's no reason why we should be a net importer of food or why many of our children should suffer from malnutrition and stunting. Um, and we believe that agriculture should be the driver of growth and economic development on the African continent. 80% of Africa's food consumption is marketed and handled by private sector operators, and there are at least 390 active solutions, tech solutions, and digital ag solutions in the landscape. We believe entrepreneurs should be at the forefront of this. However, they face many, many challenges from access to funding, to inefficient and effective market linkages, poor policy environments, talent, challenges, finding capable team members, um, and many, many, many challenges around accessing data, which prevents so many of the entrepreneurial Africans in the food and agriculture landscape from scaling their businesses. And COVID has exacerbated many of these challenges. In the heart of COVID, so many of the agriculture and food entrepreneurs who were so essential to the fight against COVID were struggling for survival. Food is medicine, and many of these entrepreneurs were dealing with issues around accessing inputs, accessing uh, produce, getting food to markets, paying salaries, etc. 
COVID brought on lots of new challenges and many of our entrepreneurs on the continent had to disengage staff, had to refinance their loans and really struggled with some of the challenges uh, listed here. And Nourishing Africa was born actually in COVID. We started slightly before, but exacerbated by COVID, we accelerated the work we were doing and engaged with so many other stakeholders. And so we actually incorporated this company a few months ago. And Nourishing Africa is envisaged as a one-stop shop for agripreneurs on the African continent. It's a hub that provides critical links to funding, data, learning resources, events, technology, talent inputs. It has a membership portal and it provides knowledge and capacity development. Our mission is to drive the profitable and sustainable growth of the agriculture and food landscape by attracting, empowering, equipping, connecting, and celebrating over a million dynamic and innovative young African agripreneurs. And our vision is a sustainable and just food ecosystem that leverages ag tech and digital innovations driven by Africa's vibrant entrepreneurs to ensure that the continent can nourish itself and become a net exporter of food by 2050. And we have a hub that's already active. We have over 600 agribusinesses on the hub. Obviously, our vision is a million, but they're already actively sharing. They're actively learning. We have a funding portal, and we're linking our entrepreneurs to funders, accelerators, incubators within Africa and across the world. We have an events portal where we showcase all the events in the agriculture landscape that they can leverage. Our knowledge portal is vibrant. It has lots of data. Um, on every single value chain. It has data by country and by um, region. And we have a food culture page where we celebrate African food um, and the vibrant collection of innovation, innovative chefs and cooks across the continent. We also have a jobs portal for entrepreneurs to find staff and for staff who are looking for jobs in the sector to find a, a good job. We have a membership only portal which has exclusive benefits for our members. Um, and we have 32 of the 54 countries already represented from farm to pork, in logistics, in packaging, and mechanization, and the numbers keep growing. We've curated um, curriculum and knowledge sessions, podcasts on a range of critical issues, webinars um, that we've organized during COVID and post-COVID around building resilience, around managing finance and liquidity, around leveraging innovation and technology, our podcasts have been amazing on every single topic that affects our entrepreneurs, and we have such excitement around some of these topics. We have a first Thursdays now, it's a digital networking for entrepreneurs across the ecosystem to get together, to share their problems, to share knowledge, to listen to experts, and through this, they're actually building relationships and connections across the continent. We launched an Ask an Expert intervention where we have an expert every week in anything from food technology to food safety to seeds and our entrepreneurs get to ask questions and engage these experts digitally. And we're just about to launch uh, an entrepreneur's recovery fund, which will include an online program and funding, mentoring, and uh, continued support for entrepreneurs so that they can recover and rebuild better. It's been an exciting time with Nourishing Africa and the interest from partners locally and globally has been amazing. The health consulting obviously birthed it, but we're partnering with a range of organizations, the FOLU, Enterprise Development Center, IBAN, uh, MasterCard Young Africa Works has been a huge pillar of support and the interest continues to grow. And as I wrap up, I'm just really excited about building these ecosystems. I think what COVID-19 has shown us is that no entrepreneur can thrive in isolation. We have to work together. We have to collaborate. We have to build strong groups. We have to raise our voices and shape policy and together we can thrive. And I'm excited about building this community of vibrant African entrepreneurs leveraging digital innovation to connect us in ways like never before and ensure that we can nourish ourselves, nourish the world, and build thriving businesses that will truly be beacons of light and hope for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Hey guys, um, thank you so much for having me do this presentation. I'm Alpha Senan, as I early, said earlier on. I'm based in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm the founder and executive director of Y Farm, which means we help youth farm. And we are in the business of, I would say, creating new farmers. We pioneer agricultural, educational, entertainment. 
And why farm is you know about changing perception and beliefs and, and, and getting youths to participate in agriculture. You know, we see a, a major problem of the aging farming population across the globe and, uh, and, 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 and identifying our young people to be able to feed us in the future. So we target children in particular, but of course we also work with young agripreneurs as well. We have a list of different programs that we do, educational programs, theoretical programs, hands-on physical training, and so many other things, exciting things to really engage our young people in not only agriculture, but we also call it agriculture. So, of course, COVID-19 have really impacted upon our work. Um, one of our flagships program called the Agripreneur Mastermind Program, where we seek to find TNTs, Trinidad and Tobago's next top agripreneur. It's like an eight weeks agripreneurship challenge. We, won, we were unable to have um, our program this year. Um, while we were planning to do it physically, of course, you know, with the restrictions, we really had to think about a way to do it digitally. So we weren't able to achieve this digital program just yet, but we're definitely planning to do so next year, March. And, um, but of course, we had to get a little more creative in how we do things. So as you see, a very creative picture here, farming in sneakers. You know, we reach out to a lot of people across Trinidad and Tobago on how they can grow. And many folks um, who were impacted negatively impacted by COVID-19, they all started to grow something. You know, so many folks were like, you know, what do we do? How do we do it? We don't have land. So we say no land space, no excuse. Just farm it. Even if you have to farm in a sneakers. And such programs of ours really caught on. And of course, we had a, 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 a significant increase in young people wanting to do digital agriculture by using hydroponics, uh, vertical farming, and really using these digital tools in their, in their farming. And um, we were able to really target many folks across Trinidad and Tobago, younger folks as well, to start farming in their backyard. And um, one of the things that we also realized that, you know, a lot of young people started doing was value-added products. So folks who weren't able to necessarily have land to farm, they wanted to like process. So this is just an example here of one of the products that we actually came up with during this period as well. Um, it's, it's called the Agriman Kalalupak. And it's, 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 it's for those of you all who might know of some of these bush from the tropics, it's called dashing bush, right? And you know, we, we made mention and we really amped up our advocacy campaign in getting young people to understand that agriculture is not just only on the farm, but it goes beyond the farm. You know, so understanding the process of taking the plant to the pack, you know, the seed to the snack, the crop to the shop, the bean to the bar, you know, creating chocolate bars. And so if, if you don't have land, you're able to actually develop new innovative products. So our campaign, our advocacy really caught on and more and more young people are actually creating new products, right? And of course, one of the things that we were affected by would be the usual um, you know, physical sales to the market and whatnot. So we created one of the uh, amazing online platform and, um, called Dashing Your Doorstep. And I have another example of one here called The Market Movers. They will have been existing for some time. So basically, we would package uh, your market items and, and you order it via WhatsApp and we would deliver it to your doorstep. So it limits the, a lot of human-to-human -human interaction, just sort of like one-on-one. -on -one and follow all, all the procedures and whatnot. So we, have, we are now developing an online actual website database to be able to deliver this service. And another, another aspect that we introduced during this period as well um, would be, you know, many folks who have been following our work for quite over, for, for, for many years, you know, they really reached out to us and asked, you know, like, we want to actually plan something now, you know, we, can't go to work, we can't go to the beach, we, you know, we want to be able to plant something. And that was like the trending thing, or it still is the trending thing in my country and in, across the Caribbean region. Everyone now is very much interested in planting something. You know, doctors, lawyers, police officers, you name it, right? So what we did is that when folks came to us and we would sell them soil, sell them the, sell them the materials, the, the plants, the, the seeds, etc. Um, 
we put them in a WhatsApp group. So we call it plant your plates. It means like plant your plates, you know, and your is like our dialect in Trinidad. So we put them in a WhatsApp group and we exchange information, we exchange crops. People would ask, you know, because it's, it's beginner, be, beginners farmers, right? You know, I have something affecting my crop, my leaf is yellowing, what do I do? And we have a few scientists in there that actually is being able to assist us as well um, with, with, with song advice and information. So our WhatsApp group have over 125 participants and um, it's going exciting, really, really exciting. And the whole idea is to get folks to be able to plant what they want to put on their plate, right? And um, of course, we were able to, we have our usual comic books that we share, um, stories of agriman adventures, because we believe that there must be an adventure to encourage youth in agriculture, starting with a main character who's branded as the world's most powerful food provider. So we have Agriman, and we, of course, we have digitized it. So we have Agriman comic books online now where kids can actually download these books. But we didn't stop there. You know, we needed to find a way because Agriman would usually go into schools. You know, kids would come on the farm. We would have training sessions. So we, we partnered up with the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, um, out of the United Nations, to be able to develop short videos, instructional videos that children could tune into and be able to grow their garden. So this is called the Grow Garden Initiative. And Agriman will teach about soil preparation, transplanting seedlings, different types of gardens. And anyone can actually go on YouTube and find these videos and actually learn from them. And so many videos that have been really, you know, really getting the attention of children whose home and may not have, you know, a lot of school activities to do, they can now develop their garden at home, right? And of course, you know, we took the opportunity as well to teach children about digital agriculture. You know, we saw that this is, the, this is where we are headed now into the world. So we partnered up with the FAO. We did an uh, entire project on the, on the status of digital agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the outputs was developing an agreement comic book introducing a new character called Agribots, coming off of robots, right? So uh, in, this, in this comic series, teaches children about digital farming, how can we digitize our farm and digitize our operation. So that's very exciting. And children, we are about to launch it on Whole Food Day, coming up in a few days' time, right? Thank you very much. And um, I hope that you guys enjoyed my presentation. And, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, check out our website. Thank you so very much. All right. So thank you very much, guys. Um, um, thank you to our panelists, including myself. And thank you to all the listeners and the viewers out there who really, um, you know, in, I hope you guys enjoyed each of the presentations. And we just want to jump right into sort of sort of discussion amongst the panelists, including myself, and um, allow for folks who's tuning in to be able to type in their questions and whatnot in the box as well. So I'm going to take a, a, the first stab at the question. Um, so Ashna, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I just want to know a bit more about like how much have young people been doing, uh, I would say, uh, cattle production um, in India? Like, is it, is it on the rise? Is it on the decline? Is it more farming families? I'm kind of curious to find this out. Yeah, absolutely. Great question because while I was looking at your presentation and I was uh, uh, thinking of the creative ways, really, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, very uh, happy to see the creative ways that you are reaching. And that means you, they're sitting, you know, continents about you're also facing the same problem that we are, which is decline in the youth uh, in, in agri and allied sectors. It's, um, of course, here, there are multiple reasons. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, rural to urban migration. Uh, there's um, uh, dairy farming specifically, you know, uh, anything related to dung and a cow dung, everything. It's not a glamorous profession. So it's not uh, currently, I would say it's not someone, every child's ambition to, you know, I will grow up and be a dairy farmer no matter what the family size or the economic status, but it is not a glorified profession. And this is where in our bits also we are, you know, trying uh, to, uh, uh, the biggest idea of involving technology into the dairy farming was that, okay, the youth will start getting involved into dairy because they may not want to be involved in 
you know, uh, um, every the, the everyday cleaning of the farm. But, you know, if they have to map the entire breeding cycle on an app or just to maintain their digital record of cattle as well as, you know, uh, farm expenses or call the veterinarian, they can still help out their, you know, parents and family uh, digitally uh, and get and, and see the interest. And uh, I feel like when you see uh, your business or your profits increasing, your interest in the sector also increases. So yes, uh, we are seeing um, a decline and we have been trying to see how technology can play a role in uh, kind of uh, um, in incentivizing the farmers uh, to be uh, the young farmers, their, their children, their ca we try to run campaigns like farmer's daughter, farmer's son, so that they feel that need to also connect with uh, their, their family business. But uh, yeah, great efforts on the, the creative aspect of bringing uh, kids onto farming. And I'm sure we can, we can learn uh, so much from you. Thank you, Ashna. Yeah, definitely. Great answer. Thank you very much. And I have a question for you. Can we ask Alpha questions, even though you're the moderator? <laughs> <laughs> so Alpha, about your business model, because I'm thinking about this and think this is phenomenal, but this sounds almost like it should be a nonprofit because who's willing to pay for this? The kids that you're serving, which is such an important, uh, the youth, you know, don't have the resources, don't, you know, how do you currently manage your operations? And is there kind of a sliding scale or do you get donor funding? How are you structured? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's an amazing question. Thank you very much for this. And um, yes, we are a nonprofit organization. However, we have a very, I would say, interesting business model behind it as well, because we have survived for five years and we're getting stronger and stronger. So definitely in terms of like, um, you know, we have sales on our comic books, but of course the children don't really pay for this. You know, we get donors to pay for this. So we'd have these projects, we'd have, you know, school tours, and we get donors to be able to sponsor these comics, to donate to, you know, this community or to donate to the school. Um, we would develop like school gardens, etc. We get folks to actually pay us to do this. And then, of course, we have like farm visits where children really who get excited about Agriman, they want to come on the farm and find Agriman. And, you know, we do like these amazing, nice hunts where Agriman is hiding somewhere and they have to find him on the farm and really create into like a real nice cool theme park, a theme park for agriculture. And, um, and then, you know, we, yes, we get the schools to actually pay for this. So like that's a small entrance fee to cover our costs for the farm visits and whatnot. Um, but we really work a lot with, with agencies such as the FAO, such as the AICA, some of these agricultural institutions to do many projects. So like one, of, one which I mentioned during my presentation, where we did the status of digital agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. And from that project, we, we were able to pay for one new comic book. You know, so it's like really working with partners to do things like that. Um, we do a lot of workshops. We even do like Agriman um, birthday parties as well. So folks would like, so we kind of really monetize Agriman, right? And um, of course, and I, and I really love your point about, you know, having a, when you, in your model, having make sure it's cost effective. So we don't have this high, high price point, but something that people can afford, you know, because it's for a social good. And a lot of, of, I mean, all what I do is really social entrepreneurship, just like yourself, Nadini, you know? So we really um, find a way to be able to tell these stories as well and get people to pay for them because it's about motivating someone. It's about inspiring someone. Um, and one of the other interesting things that we do is like when we run our programs, like Fangian, like the Ampita, the Agripreneur Mastermind Program, you know, we received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to be able to pay us to be able to deliver this program. You know, so really and truly, uh, one of the items that we're going into now is actually product development. So like with our, one of the packs that I showed, you know, the, um, the Kalalu pack, it's cut up vegetables and we branded Agriman. So now Agriman now becomes like this food brand that children could be like, wow, Agriman was in my school. I want to I wanna eat his vegetables, you know? So it's like about, it's like really transforming that, their psyche to not just want to plant, but of course, or not, but also eat and consume healthier vegetables by having Agriman branded on the pack. And we have, we actually have one of the Trinidad and Tobago's largest supermarkets, the Massey stores. They are actually carrying our product now. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I hope you actually start an Agriman game. 
on a video game mm. because my brother, this is where the young people are these days. I exactly. would love to see that. And um, please would love to partner with you in Nigeria um, and see how we can bring agreement to Nigeria. Likewise, I'm ready. Yeah, we, we will definitely have some discussion to figure that out. Alpha, did you see the, uh, a change in your strategy uh, to onboard those and to reach these uh, kids because of the entire pandemic? How did you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great question. I mean, definitely, you know, hence the reason we had to do the videos because, you know, previously we would be in schools every other day. We would be in some school and um, now, you know, school, school hasn't started back here as yet. Well, it started back online. So that's okay. virtual school right now. You know, so no physical school. So then, you know, we have teachers who are showing our videos and they are doing lessons via our videos for their class and it's working out for us and it's working out for them, you know? Um, so of course we had to really think about, we, we, we had an agriculture kids club where children would visit the farm on, a, on like on, on Saturdays. So we have to do all that online now, you know? Um, we have to do agriman camps online as well too. So a lot of the strategies have changed and it really is now opening the avenues um, as Nadini suggested, a game but, or, you know, like an, an application where kids can really tune in on their phone and see, you know, what is Agriman doing today and what challenges Agriman have for you to do today? Because we don't, I mean, we don't know how long, how much longer this is going to last. And this, is, this might just be the whole turnaround of the world right now. So everything really has to be digitized and we are, get, we are trying to get there. So our model has really been affected. But I would say affected in a good way as well too, because some of the things that we actually do it is things that we always wanted to do. And I think COVID-19 really pushed us to really doing it. And I think many of the entrepreneurs who might be listening right now, it might be, it might be similar. So I like to say obstacle turns into opportunities, you know, challenges allows you to become creative. And that is just the world that we live in now and we have to adapt it, you know? So, so let me just ask, you know, let me ask you guys, um, the biggest opportunity that probably came out of COVID-19 thus far for both of you. Like, what is the biggest opportunity that you guys could think about that, that resulted? And, and maybe I might ask the biggest challenge as well, too. So I, I, whichever one you want to answer first. Um, I, feel, I feel the challenge turned into an opportunity because um, uh, uh, the challenge was how do you reach the farmers without uh, like in India, you, how do you reach the remotest of farmers uh, without being on foot, without your fleet on street, without, you know, uh, physically connecting with them. Uh, and earlier, I feel like, uh, yes, we always had plans to kind of, uh, for example, if I'm talking about one state, the, yes, there was a plan of uh, uh, going to different uh, districts in one state, but it was a slow plan. What I feel generally COVID has done, and not just for me, I'm sure for a lot of companies is, uh, it may not have started anything, but it's definitely accelerated your vision. It has put things into acceleration. So what things you were already probably in pipeline that, okay, we will start like this, we'll go like this. And with the digital technology, we will go on this in, in the next two years. You had to kind of accelerate and widen your outreach and, you know, start that immediately. So for me, I think the biggest opportunity has been the, our mental barrier that we can only connect with farmers if, if we are face to face and if we have a fleet on street has been removed. So we, we are now mapping, you know, our customers' digital footprint, our communication footprint, where are they present? They are a lot. It doesn't need to be just for their profession, but they're on TikTok, they're on YouTube, they're on Facebook, they're everywhere. So you, you kind of broaden your uh, horizons in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, still getting access to them and uh, definitely connecting them better to understand with this entire change, what do they need now is, is I think uh, th that, that entire uh, kind of uh, um, mind space that each and every person in the company started to have that, okay, what does my customer need now? So we've put their need uh, first, uh, uh, specifically looking at the entire uh, pandemic that, kind of change their lives. Great. Thank you, Ashna. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful, um, up, I guess, obstacle to the into opportunity there, you know? Yeah. Nadini, you want to share with us? 
And yeah, just the response, yes, thank you very much. I would say there are a few things. First of all, as, as an entrepreneur myself, I've had to go through a mindset shift. Um, specifically as I engage with my team members, and I think this is relevant for all of us as entrepreneurs, is the importance of empathy and patience in a time like this, because everybody's going through something. And this has been a difficult time for so many entrepreneurs. And so learning how to demonstrate empathy and patience and how to teach entrepreneurs to demonstrate empathy and patience. On terms of the harder skills, I think it's the importance of agility. Um, and agility is the ability to respond quickly as things change. And what we've actually seen is that we have had, all had to become learners, lifelong learners. We've had to learn and unlearn. And through Nourishing Africa, we're teaching our entrepreneurs how to learn and unlearn and how to be more dependent on each other and how to build ecosystem partnerships. Um, and then from the digital innovation perspective, I think for me, I'll give you, a, you know, I wear a number of hats. For Ace Foods, a food company, we've had to learn how to work with lots of players leveraging digital. Um, we've had to learn how to communicate leveraging digital because you can't physically go from place to place. With Nourishing Africa and Sahel, we've had to learn about tools. You know, data is still expensive in our part of the world. I don't know how expensive it is in the Caribbean versus in South Asia, but in, in Africa and in Nigeria in particular, data is still expensive. And so as we work with farmers, we're having to subsidize their data access, their data charges, we're having to get extension workers to utilize um, phones. We're having to buy tablets and phones for them. We're having to basically bridge that digital divide. Um, and I think it's really important as we design and redesign tools that we figure out how we reduce the cost of access, how we reduce the cost of the digital tools, um, how we think about energy because they have to charge their phones when they don't have electricity, um, how we bridge some of those gaps so that we can really fully maximize the digital co competence and we don't continue to create the, um, bigger gaps between the have and have not because of the use of digital tools. And so that consciousness has been critical. And then the final thing I'll say is that we've actually had to infuse COVID-19 training into everything we do. But, you know, we basically have created an online digital and video tool to help people learn how to protect themselves, to help entrepreneurs and farmers mm -hmm. learn how they sell food, work with food, and still stay healthy and vibrant and minimize the spread of COVID-19. And I think Africa as a continent has done like, amazing well. The great news coming out of this is that we're building back better. We're all coming out of this realizing how important the food ecosystem is, realizing that food is medicine, realizing that like never before, you can't design health infrastructure without food infrastructure. And that the food ecosystem requires all players. So as we're designing for the future, we need tech, but we also need health. We need people in finance. We need all actors to work together to transform this landscape. And for me, I think we're going to come out stronger as a country, as a continent, as, an entre as entrepreneurs, because of how we've been stretched during this period. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing answer. I just love when you say that food is our medicine and we, you know, I, I, I can't, we can't stop. We can't say that enough because people need to understand the power of food. And, you know, I like to say food is our medicine, not medicine being our food, because we usually try to run to the pharmacy to get everything, all the nourishments that we need. And we should be running to the farm to get this nourishment. So thank you so very, very much. Yeah. Thank you. And Alpha, as we round up, I'm sure you have a great answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks <laughs> so for please, asking. Please respond. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thanks for asking. You know, um, I mean, for us, I think it really made my team and I realize how important food is to the community, right? You know, for years we have been advocating, we have been, I guess, planting that seed in the, in the, in the, in the brains and in the minds of young people, even the adults who follow our campaigns as well. But now you realize that people want healthy and safe food. People want good nourishment. People want to be able to not just get food that, that fill them, but food that, that, that fulfills them, you know? So, you know, it, it really pushed us to getting food packaged to, to, to the people. 
not everyone is able to grow their own food, or at least not in, not in the capacity that they might want to do it. You know, but so we, 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 it helped us to really package food and get it to our people, you know, starting with the community where our farm is based. And then we really, we really went out to be able to um, expand our wings into other communities as well and encourage other farmers to be able to do the same thing. You know, so it really showed us that while we have been advocating, we have been planting the seeds, you know, but it all boils down to getting people safe and healthy and affordable food, you know. So, you know, the opportunity arises for us to create these new, I would say almost new products, you know, that lit, those things literally came out of within this era now of COVID-19, but also digitize the way we actually do our services with regards to our superhero characters. And one of, one of our you know, what we really want to get done is an is a, is a, is a, um, agreement application where kids can really tune into what agreement is doing every day and every week. But, you know, it really allowed us to push us over the edge to wanting to digitize all our agreement and our agricultural, educational, entertaining work that we do. Wonderful, wonderful. Really inspired by both of you, honestly. And this has been such a great conversation. Thank you. Likewise, you know, so I think, I think, um, I think we are winding down to the end of our session, you know, so I just want to, I guess probably we can um, share some closing remarks, I, I mean, quickly, you know, for me, as, I, as I'm talking, I'll just share that, you know, I want to tell all the young people out there, you know, agripreneurs, the word, to me, the word agripreneur, it means action, you know, it can't be an agripreneur and not take action, you know. So keep the action, keep it going, keep it growing, keep it glowing, you know, continue to, to bear those fruits of your hard work, continue to feed people responsibly in whatever services you are providing. It might be machinery, input supply, food production, you know, whatever services it is, training, you know, continue to do so responsible and be able to, you know, don't matter what the climate is, don't matter what adversities come your way. You know, just continue to keep it going. Yeah, and, and I would like to add, and you know, such platforms give you the opportunity to network with people uh, which you otherwise would not, you know, get the chance to speak to or learn from. So I think one thing we have also learned is uh, how do we collaborate for greater good? Because I feel uh, anyone who's part of this sector is doing something, whether whether that's a for-profit uh, uh, institute or company or a not-for-profit, but there's always this greater good that you have in mind, you know? So the mission is, is beyond just uh, ourselves. So it's, it's, it's something that all of us need to work on. How do we collaborate more for reaching, you know, that greater good? So it was, it was a pleasure meeting and, you know, interacting with uh, you both and uh, thanks to the platform and uh, to bring us all together like this. Just to round up, I would end with my favorite African proverb, which says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. I think what COVID-19 has shown us more than ever before is that we have to go with others to go far. And in the food and agriculture landscape, the beauty of digital and the beauty of innovation is that it allows us to connect with people in ways that we've never done before, across boundaries, across countries, and across continents. And I look forward to um, partnering with you all to increase the impact of Nourishing Africa to ensure that more African entrepreneurs can scale their businesses and build this just food ecosystem to ensure that we can cross our boundaries and partner with uh, our fellow agri-partners in India, in the Caribbean, and in other parts of the world, leveraging digital tools to share knowledge, to share best practices, to learn from our failures, and to increase our impact. And I look forward to working with all of you to go far together in the food and agriculture landscape. God bless you all. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you too.